Hello, this is Jeff Gambrone. Uh, welcome to part one of Mississippians and the Army of Northern Virginia. This is uh, a uh, presentation I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, it's based on an article I did for my blog on WordPress some years ago. I've always been interested in uh, Mississippians and uh, relation to the Civil War. Uh, in particular, uh, I always found the Army of Northern Virginia of uh, of uh, particular interest because I had uh, relatives that served in a couple of units, uh, the 12th Mississippi and the 13th Mississippi Infantry that were part of the Army of Northern Virginia. And uh, also I'm doing research on uh, our regimental history of the 21st Mississippi Infantry that also served in the Army of Northern Virginia. So uh, over the past few years I've really uh, become intimately acquainted with the uh, the history of Mississippians uh, that, that fought in this army. And uh, without a doubt, uh, the most famous Confederate military organization of the Civil War was the Army of Northern Virginia. It was the principal Eastern Army, uh, and the reason for its fame was very simple. Under the leadership of General Robert E. Lee, uh, it won numerous victories over its larger and much better equipped uh, opponent, the Army of the Potomac. And although the Army of Northern Virginia wasn't created until uh, or 1862, it had its origins in uh, around Richmond, Virginia in 1861 um, when uh, troops were being shuttled, uh, shuttled to uh, Virginia to help uh, protect that region from uh, uh, a uh, presumed uh, Union offensive. Uh, among the troops being sent to Virginia were a number of Mississippi infantry regiments, and they would be some of the first Mississippians to see combat during the war. And uh, shown in this illustration is uh, a group of Confederate troops marching around Capitol Square in Richmond. And uh, early in the war, this was a very common uh, thing to happen. When the new troops came in, they would parade through uh, through Richmond and, and particularly make a, a march around Capitol Square. And uh, one of the units that did this was the Volunteer Southerns of Vicksburg, uh, who would become part of the 21st Mississippi Infantry. Uh, they arrived in Richmond in June of 1861, and a, late, a witness later wrote uh, an account of, uh, of their march through the city. And uh, this witness said, quote, I stood there and gazed at their movement with admiration and delight. They were the boys of old Mississippi, and their neat uniforms, their soldierly bearing, and above all, their perfect time of their step and ease of their evolutions elated one with pride and aroused in all present the sentiment of admiration. I say confidently that it is the best drilled company I have yet seen. And uh, this is not uh, not unusual for the volunteer Southerns. They got a lot of compliments on their uh, their drill and their uh, how smart they looked on parade. They were a pre-war militia un unit. They had been in, in uh, existence for a number of years prior to the war. They were very well equipped uh, for a pre-war militia unit. They had very fancy uniforms, and they were very good at marching. Uh, not all the Mississippians who showed up in, in Virginia in 61 uh, were as polished as the volunteer Southerns. In fact, uh, some of them were, were pretty raw. But uh, uh, for a, a uh, well-trained militia unit like the Southerns, they really did uh, uh, make a good impression uh, in the early stages of the war to the, to the observers who saw them. Now, the first Mississippians... Uh, to see combat, or in the uh, uh, in the parlance of the of the day, saw the elephant uh, would would be the Mississippians who fought in the Battle of First Manassas on July twenty first, eighteen sixty one. In this fight, uh, Confederates under uh, Confederate General P. G. T. Beauregard, uh, combined with those of General Joseph E. Johnston, uh, would repulse the Union advance from Washington D. C. Uh, the combined Confederate Army uh, that won the battle was initially known as the Army of the Potomac. Uh, thankfully, for uh, all concerned, they very soon changed this name because it gets very confusing because, the, of course, the Federal Army was also known as the Army of the Potomac. And uh, one uh, Mississippian in the 18th Mississippi Infantry Regiment wrote an account of the battle, and uh, this is what the, the newspaper said uh, uh, he recounted. He said, quote, 
The brigade of which Colonel Burt's regiment was a part was ordered to take a battery on a high hill near McLean's Ford. We went over in the morning to make the attack. But just before we got there, the order was countermanded. We returned and waited until evening. At 4 o'clock p.m., we went over and made a most daring and reckless charge. The brigade marched down a hollow in four ranks facing the enemy and his cannon. The South Carolina Regiment in front were permitted to form in line of battle. Just as the 18th Mississippi Regiment was forming into line, canister and grape shot, shells and mini balls poured down on us like hailstones. The command charge being given by someone, the regiment moved at the double quick to the top of the hill, about 200 yards. After remaining there the, in the old field for half an hour, exposed to continuous volleys of shot and shell, trying to rally and get a chance at the Yankees who were safe under the cover of the brow of a hill and at a convenient distance of four or 500 yards off, it was ordered to fall back into the wood and reform. And this account is from the, uh, the Weekly Mississippian, uh, August 7th, 1861. And in the, the Battle of First Manassas, uh, there were five Mississippi units engaged. Uh, the 2nd, the 11th, the 13th, the 17th, and the 18th Mississippi Infantry Regiments. And uh, in fact, shown in this illustration here is the 2nd Mississippi Infantry uh, passing through the, the town of Winchester, Virginia. This illustration is from uh, Harper's Weekly in August of 1861. But uh, the Mississippi units involved in the Battle at First Manassas suffered combined casualties of 84 men killed or wounded, which by, by later standards would be extremely light casualties. But uh, uh, for that time, they were considered uh, pretty, pretty significant. And uh, Private Abner O. South, who served in the 2nd Mississippi Infantry, gave this interesting, uh, if somewhat poorly spelled and grammatically incorrect description of the battle. He said, quote, the fight was for eight or so miles up and down Bull Run, and back from it some two miles on our side, about three-fourths on their side. Bums, shells, and mortars buzzing and flying in every direction all over the field, and when falling, bursting and spreading destruction all around. They fight, the fight commenced about six o'clock in the morning and lasted until dark, even in the night. They commenced retreating about four o'clock from where, uh, in the most utmost confusion, the first running over those behind. It was the most complete route ever known to history. And uh, I don't know if it was the most complete route ever known to history, but it was a route, and the, the Confederates did win the battle. And uh, we're going to be somewhat overconfident because of it. I don't think anyone at this point in the war really realized just how bloody and how protracted uh, the, the war was going to be. And in addition to the five regiments that fought at First Manassas, by the end of 1861, there were five more Mississippi units uh, serving in Virginia. Uh, these included the 12th, the 16th, the 19th, and the 21st Infantry Regiments, and the 2nd Mississippi Infantry Battalion. Uh, they were joined in the summer of 1862 by the 42nd Mississippi Infantry, and then the last Mississippi Infantry Regiment to reach Virginia was the 26th Mississippi Infantry, which was transferred to the East in 1864. And the, the illustration you see here, which is from the Library of Congress, is of an unidentified member of the, of the Jake Thompson Guards, Company K, 19th Mississippi Infantry. And you can see here this uh, unknown private is wearing a very fancy early war Mississippi uh, militia uniform. And thankfully, uh, they took the time to make up a, uh, a little sign with JT guards on it. Otherwise, this would be just a completely unknown image. And uh, uh, you saw this kind of finery on a lot of early war units. Uh, of course, as the war went on, uh, the, the uniforms tended to get much plainer. Now, in addition to the infantry regiments in the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, the, the artillery and the cavalry branches were represented as well. Uh, Mississippi had two batteries of artillery in the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, the Madison Light Artillery and the Confederate Guards Artillery. There was also one uh, cavalry unit, uh, the Jeff Davis Legion of Cavalry. Uh, all told, between infantry, artillery, and cavalry, uh, Mississippi uh, had approximately 16,000 men 
that served in the Army of Northern Virginia between 1861 and 1865. And uh, this is a pretty significant number for a, a state uh, that was small in population and also very uh, removed from uh, Virginia and the Eastern Theater by a very long distance. But uh, a lot of the early war units really wanted to go to Virginia because they felt that was where the fighting was going to be, and, and uh, they weren't wrong. But for the Mississippians who went uh, east in 1861, uh, these were actually some of the most deadly days of the war, but uh, it, it was not deadly because of uh, fighting. It was deadly because of disease. Um, these men were, were put into big camps with thousands of men uh, at the start of the war. These were, these were guys from small towns and communities all over the state, uh, most of them from rural backgrounds. Um, most of them had not been exposed to a lot of communicable diseases, things like uh, measles, mumps, diphtheria, smallpox, and they had no immunity to it. So when they got into these big camps and start, started uh, getting exposed to these diseases, they began falling ill in really uh, huge numbers. Uh, one captain in the 19th Mississippi Infantry uh, wrote an account of uh, his unit falling prey to disease, and he was quoted as saying, since we pitched our camp here, gloom and sorrow have saddened the countenances of all, owing to the distressing fact that disease and death have prevailed among us. Our exposed condition during our camp on Bull Run and the want of proper food and water was a serious blow to this regiment and to all the troops that were likewise unfortunate. And, uh, this account was uh, taken from the Holmes County Republican, Millersburg, Millersburg Ohio, September 19, 1861. And that was pretty common for uh, newspapers all over the country to pick up uh, uh, quotes that have been published in other papers. Uh, this one from the 19th Mississippi captain, probably a first run in a southern paper, and then got picked up uh, by one of the northern papers. The next Mississippians uh, to see action in Virginia were soldiers of the 13th, 17th, and 18th uh, Infantry Regiments, who were part of the, the Confederate forces that uh, routed uh, the Union Army at the Battle of, Bull, of Balls Bluff, Virginia, on October 21st, 1861. And shown in this illustration is one of the great uh, dramatic moments of the battle when uh, very prominent Union officer Edward D. Baker uh, was killed at the Battle of Balls Bluff. Uh, leading the men uh, uh, of these regiments uh, in the battle was uh, Colonel Winfield Scott Featherston of the 17th Mississippi Infantry, who urged his men on into the battle with the uh, cry of, Charge, Mississippians, charge! Drive them into the Potomac or into eternity! And I just I love that quote. It just it, it really captures the moment so well. And uh, Captain Albert Gallatin Brown of the 18th Mississippi Infantry, who was involved in this action, later wrote of the battle, As we neared the field, the firing on our side became irregular, and it seemed that our forces were falling back. We gave one long, loud, unearthly howl, and plunged forward like so many wild devils. And uh, this is from the Weekly Mississippian, uh, November 20th, 1861. And uh, the Confederate attack did uh, literally push the, the uh, Union forces back into the Potomac River. And it was a, a, uh, a route and a uh, serious embarrassment uh, for the, uh, the Union forces involved. After Ball's Bluff, uh, the Mississippians in Virginia had a relatively tranquil time uh, until the spring of 1862 when General Joseph E. Johnson began withdrawing south uh, to block um, General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac. Uh, they had traveled by water, uh, landed on the Virginia Peninsula southeast of Richmond, uh, placing the uh, Confederate capital in uh, a very serious threat of capture. Uh, Johnson moved his troops uh, to the peninsula to oppose the federal move, but uh, he only had about 60,000 men to oppose McClellan's 112,000 uh, Yankees. On May 4th, uh, 1862, McClellan began his advance. Uh, the Confederates were forced to, to fall back uh, in the face of the much larger army, but there was significant rear guard fighting at uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. 
Uh, the 19th Mississippi Infantry and the 2nd Mississippi Battalion were both heavily involved in the fight at Williamsburg, and uh, they had a total of 141 men killed or wounded uh, in this fight. Uh, the Natchez Daily Courier, uh, May 28, 1862, uh, published uh, this account uh, uh, from a member of the Natchez Fencibles, who were part of uh, Company B of the 12th Mississippi Infantry. They weren't uh, engaged at Williamsburg, but they were present for the battle, and uh, one of the men wrote this, uh, this account. Uh, he said, We started off double quick through mud knee deep. And as we passed through Williamsburg, we were ordered to leave our knapsacks until we returned. As we passed along the streets, the ladies at every step were cheering us on into the fray. And uh, uh, I like that account. It's, uh, it's very descriptive. Um, that's why I really love getting first-person accounts of these, these battles, because reading it firsthand from the men that actually experienced these, uh, these battles firsthand, it, 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 you just can't beat primary sources for this kind of material. It really it drives home the, the effect that the war had on just the common men that made up the, the Confederate Army. And shown in this pencil illustration is the Shenandoah Valley, uh, looking from Maryland Heights. And uh, while the main armies were operating on the peninsula, uh, General Thomas uh, Stonewall Jackson was in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia with a small army as a diversionary force. His basic mission was to try and draw federal troops away from the Virginia Peninsula, and uh, marching with Jackson was only one regiment of Mississippians, in fact, the only Mississippians that would ever serve under his command, uh, the 16th Mississippi Infantry Regiment. And... Uh, there was a small clash at Union Church in the Shenandoah Valley on June 8th of 1862, and involved in this fight was the 16th Mississippi. Uh, the Natchez Daily Courier reported on this fight and gave the following quote from one of the, the men of the 16th Mississippi that was involved. Uh, it said, quote, At the Battle of Union Church on Sunday, the 8th instant, the 16th Mississippi, Colonel Posey, greatly distinguished itself, and the colonel was badly wounded. The regiment was placed in the woods to support one of our batteries, but the enemy discovering the position shelled the ground occupied by the Mississippians. Under the heavy fire, they calmly stood, waiting for the word to advance until a Yankee column deployed into line of battle directly to their front, only 40 yards distant. The 16th now delivered their fire, which was the most deadly in its results. No less than 250 Yankees bit the dust, the column was completely broken. The Mississippians then charged upon the enemy who fled in the utmost disorder. The conduct of the regiment throughout was much applauded. And shown in this inset uh, picture is another image from the Library of Congress. And this is Silas A. Shirley, uh, one of the men in the 16th Mississippi Infantry. This is, a very, again, a very early war picture. Uh, you could tell from the victory or death sign uh, that this image was taken in Corinth, probably when the unit was in the process of uh, uh, getting ready to board trains to head to Virginia. And you'll see a lot of uh, these Corinth pictures uh, crop up uh, very early in the war. A lot of uh, Mississippians got their picture taken with that victory or death sign. The next battle that, uh, that Mississippians were going to be involved in was the Battle of Seven Pines uh, from May 31st to June 1st, 1862. And uh, this is another illustration from the Library of Congress and shows the battle Union soldiers on the battlefield of Seven Pines. And uh, in this battle, uh, Johnson attempted to take away the initiative uh, from the Federals by attacking an exposed portion of the uh, Federal Army as it approached Richmond. Only two Mississippi units were really heavily engaged uh, at Seven Pines, the 12th Mississippi Infantry and the 2nd Mississippi Battalion. And they suffered combined casualties of about 280 men killed, wounded, or missing. Uh, the fight uh, ended in, a, in basically a stalemate. It was a draw, but it had one very important uh, consequence. Uh, Johnson was wounded in the battle and had to be replaced as Army commander, and of course, uh, that uh, position was taken by General Robert E. Lee. And a member of the Natchez Fencibles, again, Company B, 12th Mississippi Infantry, 
uh, wrote this account of the battle at Seven Pines for his local newspaper, and he, he said, uh, quote, early on the morning of the 31st, General Rhodes' brigade, of which we had the honor to belong, attacked the enemy in their camp. And after six hours of hard fighting, all of which time we were in the foremost ranks, charging and taking batteries and driving the enemy from their strong positions, we found ourselves in full possession of the enemy's comfortable quarters. Also a large amount of commissary stores, five or six pieces of cannon, some small arms, ammunition, etc., etc., and in goodly numbers of prisoners of which we proceeded to appropriate. Uh, this was published in the Natchez Daily Courier, uh, July 24th, 1862. And uh, you, you can find actually lots of accounts by the Mississippians who, who served in the Army of Northern Virginia in their local papers. Uh, the folks back home, uh, their, their uh, relatives and, and friends, wanted to keep up with what was going on. And so very commonly the men were writing back and, and a lot of these letters were being published in the, in the local papers. So uh, if there was a particular unit that your relative served in, if there's a, a surviving local paper, you can, uh, there's a very good chance you can find uh, accounts of a lot of the battles they were in in, in their local papers. And this, of course, is General Robert E. Lee, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. And on taking command of the Army, Lee officially changed its name to the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, the name by which it would be known for the remainder of the war. And to deal with the Federal Army threatening Richmond, he launched a series of attacks uh, known as the Seven Days Battles because they lasted a full week from uh, June 25th until July 1st of 1862. And during this week, uh, the Mississippians in the Army of Northern Virginia were going to see extremely heavy combat, uh, many of them for the first time, and the casualty uh, lists were going to be extremely long. And the Hines County Gazette uh, wrote this, uh, this obituary for one Mississippian who was killed in the fighting, and it said, Scarcely had the electric wires thrilled our bosoms with the news of a series of brilliant victories achieved by our brave soldiers over a foe superior in numbers and all the appliances of modern warfare when our hearts were shocked and agonized by the telegraphic reports of the casualties of the bloody and protracted struggle. Uh, this is taken from the obituary of Thomas Wade Moffat, who served in Company E of the 18th Mississippi Infantry. Uh, Company E was known as the Mississippi College Rifles. Uh, they were raised right here in, in uh, the town I live in, in Clinton, Mississippi, and they were largely made up of uh, students and professors from Mississippi College. And it's always been a, a great uh, favorite of mine because uh, I went to MC. I got my master's in history there. Uh, as I walked the campus, I often passed the uh, the Love is Immortal uh, monument to the uh, to the uh, 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 Mississippi College Rifles. So the, that unit's kind of kind of uh, a personal favorite. But uh, yeah, Moffitt was killed, uh, and uh, his obituary was published in the Hines County Gazette, uh, July thirtieth, eighteen sixty two. The next battle uh, that the Mississippians were engaged in during the seven days was the Battle of Gaines Mill. And in fact, uh, this uh, photograph is of uh, casualties that were left on the, the battlefield um, that uh, have just uh, been unburied, which was not, not that uncommon. Uh, uh, also shown in the inset illustration is General Winfield Scott Featherston, who commanded a lot of the Mississippi, Missis Mississippians who fought at Gaines Mill. Uh, at the battle, uh, which took place on June 27th, uh, the 2nd Mississippi Infantry and the 11th Mississippi Infantry had combined casualties of 55 men killed and 272 wounded. Uh, this was the Mississippi Brigade of uh, General Winfield Scott Featherston, consisting of the 12th, 19th, and 2nd Battalion, were also engaged at Gaines Mill. And uh, three days later, they were shot up again at the Battle of Fraser's Farm, suffering 666 casualties in the two engagements. So uh, for a lot of Mississippians, uh, this the seven days fighting was extremely bloody. And for many of them, it was a rude shock uh, to uh, what the war was really going to be like. 
Uh, one of the, the Mississippians wounded at Gaines Mill was Isaac N. Knox, who was a private in Company H of the 11th Mississippi Infantry. And his granddaughter related a story about uh, his wounding. She said uh, he used to tell how, just after the injury, he was carried with others from the battlefield to the porch of a nearby house. There, when the doctors looked them over, he had passed out, but came to when he heard a doctor say, this leg will have to be amputated. Roused to a point of order, he explained that he would shoot any doctor who attempted to cut off his leg. He healed and rejoined the army as a cavalryman since he could ride but not walk far. He kept the leg and it was buried with him in 1922 in Pontotoc County. And uh, that account is taken from the Clarion Ledger on February 7, 1988. And uh, amputation was a very real uh, possibility for uh, Mississippians that were wounded in an arm or leg. If you were hit in one of the bones, uh, the mini balls of the time, those soft lead bullets, did a tremendous amount of damage. And in a lot of cases, the damage was just so severe that your best chance of surviving the injury was a quick amputation. And the medical doctors of the time were quite skilled at uh, doing amputations. And there we, they would do lots of them during the Civil War. And uh, uh, post-war in Mississippi, a very common scene was to see a, Miss, uh, a former soldier with an empty sleeve or a, uh, wearing a, a artificial leg. Uh, there were lots of Mississippians uh, having to deal with uh, crippling uh, injuries that they had suffered during the war. This next illustration is of the Battle of Savage Station, Virginia. And again, this is from the Library of Congress collections. Uh, the Mississippi Brigade of Brigadier General Richard Griffith, who is shown in the inset picture here on the left, uh, did not see any serious action on June 29th uh, during the Battle of Savage Station, but they were engaged uh, just as dark was coming on right at the very end of the battle. Uh, casualties were light, but General Griffith was slain. Uh, and Colonel William Barksdale of the 13th Mississippi had to take over command of the brigade. And we, we will be hearing much more of him uh, as this talk goes on. And a notice of the death of General Griffith was posted in his local newspaper. And it said, quote, The announcement made by the Telegraph some days since of the death of General Griffith for many years past a citizen of this county took our community by surprise. He fell on the 27th, uh, and that's a mistake, it was actually the 29th, uh, ultimate on one of the battlefields near Richmond, having been struck by a random shell. His brigade was not engaged in the fight then progressing, being in reserve, but it was drawn up in line of battle. The event was as mysterious as wonderful. He was a gentleman much esteemed in all the relations of life. Uh, that's from the Hines County Gazette, July 9, 1862. And General Griffith would leave a widow and a number of children, uh, including one uh, who would grow up uh, to become uh, mayor of Vicksburg in the early 1900s. The final engagement of the Seven Days Battles was the Battle of Malvern Hill, which is illustrated in uh, this, uh, this sketching. And it shows uh, Union artillery uh, firing on uh, the attacking Confederates. Um, in the inset is... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel William L. Brandon of the 21st Mississippi Infantry, one of the uh, Mississippi units that did take part in this battle. And uh, the Battle of Malvern Hill was fought on July 1st, 1862. In this battle, uh, General Lee made one last attempt to destroy the Army of the Potomac. Uh, the Yankees were massed on Malvern Hill with uh, lots of artillery support, and the Confederates advanced into uh, just a maelstrom of uh, of artillery and musketry. Um, they went up, they attacked hard, and they were uh, repulsed with heavy, extremely heavy casualties. The Mississippi Brigade commanded by Colonel Barksdale was shot to pieces, and Barksdale later wrote that to his men, quote, advanced upon the enemy under a terrible fire of shell, grape, canister, and mini balls. The entire command, although one-third of its number fell upon the field, maintained its ground with undaunted courage and dealt bravely terrible blows upon the ranks of the enemy. And although uh, the Confederate attack at Malvern Hill was repulsed with extremely heavy casualties, 
the Union Army did retreat after the fight, uh, so uh, it ended the immediate threat to Richmond. Uh, the The enemy had been uh, had been driven away, but uh, the the success came at an extremely high cost. Uh, the Army of Northern Virginia suffered over twenty thousand casualties during the seven days fighting, and over fifteen hundred of these casualties were Mississippians. Uh, among the casualties was uh, Lieutenant Colonel William L. Brandon, shown in the picture uh, here, uh, who was commanding the 21st Mississippi Infantry at the battle. He was hit in the leg uh, by a canister shot, did have to have an amputation, um, which he survived. Uh, he was a tough guy. Uh, William L. Brandon was in his uh, mid-50s at the time the war started. Uh, I'm in my uh, my 50s myself, and I cannot imagine uh, leading troops in combat at this age. Um, he, but he not only did it, he, he uh, was severely wounded, survived an amputation in which they ran out of chloroform, so he was basically awake when they did it, but he survived, although he was never able to come back and, uh, and uh, resume a combat role with the 21st Mississippi Infantry. Uh, he ended up uh, going back to Mississippi, uh, was made a general of Mississippi militia, and uh, served out the remainder of the war in the Magnolia State. In the aftermath of Malvern Hill, uh, Colonel Benjamin G. Humphreys, who was commander of the 21st Mississippi Infantry, had to do what uh, most of the Mississippi commanders did after, after the, the fighting had ended, write letters of condolence to a lot of the families of men that, uh, that had died in the fighting. And uh, in a letter to Richard T. Archer, whose son Edward had been killed at Malvern Hill, uh, Colonel Humphreys uh, said this. He said, quote, My regiment suffered greatly. The very best young men were the first to fall, and has produced much sadness and melancholy among their comrades. Yet we do not despond. We feel fully able to cope with the hordes of the earth and finally drive them from our soil. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the casualty list... Uh, for the seven days battles, which were extremely long, were just the beginning. Uh, there were going to be many more battles and many more casualties, and uh, we'll cover the next uh, the next uh, part of this in part two of Mississippians of the Army of uh, Northern Virginia, which will be uh, 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 coming uh, very shortly. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them. I'll try and answer them as best I can, and uh, thank you very much.